morning we'll continue our meditation on the Belgic Confession, looking at the 31st chapter in that confession. This chapter is on what I call church officers. It is a description of those who serve as ministers within the church. And the article reads as follows. We believe that ministers of God's word, elders and deacons, ought to be chosen to their offices by lawful election of the church with prayer and in good order as stipulated by the word of God. Therefore, everyone shall take care not to intrude by improper means. He shall wait for the time that he is called by God so that he may have sure testimony and thus be certain that his call comes from the Lord. Ministers of the word, in whatever place they are, have equal power and authority, for they are all servants of Jesus Christ, the only universal bishop and the only head of the church. In order that this holy ordinance of God may not be violated or rejected, we declare that everyone must hold the ministers of the word and the elders of the church in special esteem because of their work and as much as possible be at peace with them without grumbling or arguing. We've considered the fact that the church has its own form of government. We have a civil government whereby the civil authorities have the authority of the sword they may execute criminals. There is the uh, government of the family, whereby husbands and, and, and wives have responsibility for their children and exercise discipline as seems fit in their circumstances. Similarly, the church has its own form of government. Uh, the exercise of government in the church is not by the sword, nor is it by the rod, but it is by the keys of the kingdom. And so the church opens its doors to those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, but also closes the doors to those who do not have a true faith in Christ. And so now we begin to consider who is it that occupies these positions of authority and responsibility within the life of the church. And the confession begins to develop that for us. And it's an important conversation, and we need to recall that... Uh, Guido de Bray was writing back in the 1500s, and uh, what he has to say really has much to do with our own contemporary situation as well, because things have not really changed a whole lot since then. In the Roman Catholic Church, as well as today the Episcopal churches and perhaps other Methodist churches and so forth, uh, you have a, a monarchical system of government whereby uh, individuals may be appointed to office in particular churches. And so the congregation may not per se have a vote on someone who is appointed to be their priest or their pastor. It may be somebody simply who is appointed to that congregation and they need to respond to that person. Uh, the uh, confession here notes that in scripture, the congregations themselves had a vote. They were to choose from among themselves who was to serve. And so, uh, there, there was an appointment. You recall Paul admonished Timothy and Titus to appoint those to serve as elders and deacons within the church, and he gave the qualifications for them. But those who were appointed needed to be received by the congregation by a vote. And so uh, there would be a vote on behalf of those who would serve in those capacities. Uh, you recall that when deacons were nominated in Acts chapter 6, uh, the congregation chose from among themselves uh, it seven men, six men, to serve as deacons within the church of that time. Uh, so uh, that, that was the, the way in which uh, pastors and elders and deacons are, are appointed within the life of the church. The congregation has a say in who it is that will serve in the life of that congregation. And so we do not agree with the Roman church that the, the bishop or the cardinal or even the pope appoints somebody to a local congregation or anything like that. Uh, continuing on, the uh, 
those who would serve in the church also must not simply run into office on their own as though uh, by their own appointment they have uh, the right to be called pastor or elder within the church. You find that on the other side of the religious spectrum in, in Protestant churches among the Anabaptist movement where some feel that they might be called to the ministry and then they run off and then begin gathering a group of people around them to form a church. And so there, there's no submission of that individual to a larger form of government, to a presbytery that can evaluate the person as to whether they are indeed qualified to serve in that capacity. Um, there's no evaluation of them. Uh, they impose themselves, if you will, on others. And uh, sometimes that can lead to some very um, bad situations where someone is not properly qualified, not truly called to the ministry, uh, and their minds are occupied with a lot of uh, false ideas about the gospel of Christ. And so there needs to be an evaluation of those who would serve. Uh, that's why we have in the Presbyterian form of government a presbytery that evaluates those individuals, men, who would serve in the office of pastors or elders in the local church. They are evaluated by the local session. But there's an evaluation process. First, the individual should sense a call to the ministry. Uh, those who serve as pastors should sense that God has set them apart for this sacred office. They should have a love for the scriptures, a love for God's word, a love for God's people, a desire to see the gospel advance in their community, a desire for God's people to be strengthened in their faith. Uh, these are some of the things that ought to mark someone called to the gospel ministry. They should have a personal life of prayer. They should be ready to intercede for their people. Uh, so these are things that we should look for within the life of one who would be called to the ministry. At the same time, he needs to be evaluated by the congregation and by the presbytery. Does this individual have truly the gifts to serve as a pastor? There are very well-meaning folks who may have a desire to serve Christ and may have a, a fair understanding of the Word of God, but really don't have properly the gifts for the Christian ministry. They may not be able to preach effectively. They may not be able to witness to Christ. They may not be able to counsel. They, they may be missing some administrative gifts or what have you. In, in any case, no one pastor will have all the gifts in themselves, but there should be some evidence or sign recognized by the congregation that this pastor is effective in the preaching of the gospel. He is effective in praying for his people and so forth. And so that needs to be evaluated by the local congregation and by uh, the presbytery at large. And so in our presbyteries, we have trials for men who would seek to be called to the ministry. They undergo a variety of exams, including an oral exam before the presbytery, where they're asked about their faith, not only how they came to faith in Christ, but also their understanding of the scriptures. And we have a very thorough evaluation of them. They also come before the presbytery with uh, commendations from uh, other ministers in the church or elders in the church that have observed the, the conduct and ministry of this particular candidate. And so there's tremendous evaluation as to who should serve as a pastor in the church. And so we don't just simply assert ourselves into the ministry, nor is somebody just dropped into a local congregation and said, this is going to be your pastor, whether you like it or not. And back in the day, in the Reformation time, uh, individuals would purchase a, an opportunity to serve in a particular uh, location as a pastor or a priest, even if they did not have any qualifications to that end. Um, so that was a, a great problem. And the confession writes out, or is written in part uh, to counter that. Uh, ministers of the word, in whatever place they are, have equal power and authority, for they are all servants of Jesus Christ. Uh, there is a hierarchy within the Presbyterian Church, local congregations, the Presbytery, and the General Assembly, but we are all equal in terms of our ability to vote. We have one vote. Uh, whether I, I serve on the session in the Presbytery or in the General Assembly, I have just one vote. The uh, individual who leads the, the, the presbytery or the general assembly, the moderator, uh, if they vote at all, just has one vote to add uh, to the, the number. So there's no, 
No one particular minister was greater than another in that respect. Now, some have special gifts, some are uniquely qualified, some do extremely well in particular aspects of the ministry, but we are all servants of Christ Jesus. Uh, and we don't have pastors or priests, bishops, uh, cardinals, and the Pope, that kind of uh, an arrangement. Christ is the bishop of the church. He's the one who is our overseer. Uh, and so it's to him that we uh, appeal. And finally, the, the article concludes by uh, reminding us of our responsibility, all of us, to hold ministers of the word and the elders of the church in special esteem because of their work. Um, we are admonished by the scriptures to uh, obey our elders, to submit to their leadership um, as they serve us in the Lord, as they follow scriptures and uh, admonishing and counseling us. We should respect that and submit to that. Uh, not because of that particular individual, but because of whom they represent, Christ himself. They are ministers of the word. They don't just simply impose their own will upon folks. That They should never do that. But always root their uh, instruction and uh, discipline in the word of Christ. And so they should receive uh, high regard within the life of the church. I would note that in looking at uh, the world around us today, there's a fair bit of hostility towards pastors and pastoral role. Uh, I've seen folks on, on, online decry uh, the presence of a, a, a paid clergy, uh, as though Paul didn't say that the worker is worthy of his wages. Um, and I, I've seen some who decry scholarship within the ministry, as though it was something that was polluting and corrupting. Uh, and so they assert themselves or somebody else that they prefer Instead, uh, uh, we need to be very careful about those kinds of things. Uh, recognize Christ's gifts to his church. Christ himself gives pastors and teachers and elders into the church. And we should receive them with thanksgiving and support them in their work through prayer and encouragement and uh, make their labor, labor uh, a joyful.